Last time we spoke, you mentioned a little bit about Randall Cycle. I was honestly pretty new to it. And then ever since then, I've watched several videos on your channel where you talk a lot more in detail. I think it's really, really important information for us to understand if we are deciding to add carbohydrates back to a higher fat or a meat, you know, a carnivore diet and the ramifications of that, you know, I've talked about possibly the uric acid cycle, gout, and these other things with purines and fructose, but the Randall cycle is actually affects everything in all foods. It's not just fructose food. So I'd love for you to just take over and educate us with the wisdom that you can share about the Randall cycle. Sure, sure. It'd be my absolute pleasure, Judy. First of all, thank you very much for having me back again. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and to your people. And if you're not subscribed to my channel as well, folks, do consider going across there and subscribing. Fair warning though, over there, things are a bit different. I do, I do tend to use some short words just for a bit of clickbaity, you know, just for fun. But the, the information, yeah, the information is still good. Anyway, let's deal with Randall. And yes. what I need to say to you up front, everybody, is that this, if you haven't heard this before, this is probably the single most mm -hmm important biochemistry lesson you will ever sit through. So please do sit up straight, face the front, stop throwing paper darts at the back, and pay attention because this is critical for you to understand. Yeah. Basically, how does this all come about? Right, why does this all come about, I guess? The first thing to say is this is not new information. All right, we're looking at an image of the, um, the discoverer or the proposer if you like, of the Randall cycle. This is Sir Philip Randall, 1926 to 2006. And he proposed the Randall cycle in an article which was published in April of 1963. So this is this Randall cycle idea is not a new idea. This is not some earth shattering idea. This is not something that is new and fangled. We have known about this absolutely since 1963, and it's been largely ignored by the nutritional fraternity at large for some reason, for some incomprehensible reason. I cannot work out what the reason is that this has been ignored because this is so important. Why is this so important, Judy? Well, this is important because there are a number of commentators currently running around on the internet suggesting to people that it's a really good idea on the carnival diet for you to add in an amount of carbohydrate every day for various reasons, which are false reasons, which we can get to later if you like. They do not withstand um, even the most cursory refutation, really. You know who you are, you people that are running around saying to people you should eat a bunch of carbohydrates every day. The Randall cycle suggests a number of things to us, including the absolutely unequivocal means definite, the definite reason why that is absolutely definitely contraindicated, which is another word for don't do that. It is bad for you. Basically, the way we need to view carbohydrate in the diet is we need to view it as what it is, and that is it is a toxin. It is a poison. Mm. There is no place whatever in the human diet for exogenous carbohydrate in your diet. None at all. And the Randall cycle tells us why that is so, which I'll get to when I stop waffling about it. Okay, so the background is that for the last four and a half million years, give or take, humans and immediately pre-human species have lived on this planet under a given lifestyle, that lifestyle being obligate hypercarnivore. How do we know that is true? How do we know that is definitely true? None of us were alive four and a half million years ago. Am I just guessing here? No, here's why not. Because what we can do is a thing called stable isotope testing. What we can do is we can find the human and, and immediately pre-human remains. There are skeleton skeletal structures, long bones that are left behind. We can find those all over the world. 
and we can open those long bones up and we can get some collagen out of those bones. Collagen is a protein. It's the most common protein in the human body. And you'll find a significant amount of collagen in long bones. Collagen is a very stable protein. It dries out, obviously, after the body dies, but it remains intact for tens and hundreds of thousands of years. No problem at all. We can still find viable collagen in the long bones millennia later, even. And we can analyze the makeup of that collagen in terms of the stable isotope makeups, in terms of the carbon and the nitrogen found in that collagen in those long bones. And that tells us slam dunk, no question, no debate, no maybe, no if, no but. It tells us what that individual definitely ate during its lifetime down to the specific speciation of animals that that human being was predating on and eating. And what that data tells us is that human beings, for at least 350,000 years, which is as long as human beings have existed in our current form, we have definitely unequivocally eaten a diet which consisted 80% the flesh and fat of large ruminant animals, with a few other animals thrown in here and there, and 20% very, very fibrous, very, very starch poor roots and tubers, basically very, very fibrous materials. And that 20% of fibrous materials was stuff that we were digging up, collecting, taking home, boiling the hell out of probably, and eating as some kind of gruelly slop type stuff to subsist when the hunt was unsuccessful or the animals were not there to predate upon. Okay, and it wasn't starch rich like current tubers and roots are that have been selectively bred to be so. This was basically fiber is what these people were eating. Now, as you know, fiber breaks down in the enteric system only under the influence of bacteria that basically break it down a little bit. And what they produce for us is short chain fatty acids, not carbohydrates. Okay, so basically the human diet for 350,000 years up to the point where the agrarian revolution kicked in about 8,000 years ago, human beings ate a diet which to all intents and purposes was 100% protein and fat, given that the fiber broke down to short chain fatty acids and not carbohydrates. There was no carbohydrate in the human diet at all. None. Zero. What about when they say that there was like berries around? Okay, two weeks a year, yes, two, two or three weeks a year, seasonally for some human beings, there were berries around. Humans did obviously mm -hmm. take advantage of that. They did eat berries. We did still have a salivary amylase gene, of course, because there's no negative selection pressure to knock it out. So, of course, we've still had that. And as we get talking about the Randall cycle, you'll see why that may well have been a very, very important thing. And it may well also be even a thing that also helped to inform how the Randall cycle did evolve in human beings uh, as well. So yes, you're quite right, Judy. There were, there were a couple of weeks of year, a couple of weeks during the year when there was some carbohydrate in the diet. Quite right. Um, I'm talking across the, the vast majority of the year, the other 50 weeks of the year or so, give or take, no carbohydrates at all. Zero. So good, thanks. Great correction there. Absolutely right. All right, so let's deal with this Randall cycle. What is it? Why is it? Why do I go on about it so much? I mean, it's it seems to anyone that watches my channel and watches my material, they will know this is streets ahead of anything else is my favorite topic, my favorite thing to discuss. The favorite point I bring up, especially when I'm indulging in the debunkment of people who suggest that we should eat a, a rich plant-based diet, or indeed those people running around saying, yes, sure, eat carnivore, but also make sure you throw in some carbohydrates as well. And, uh, and this is the reason why you ought not do that. 